the title of today's lesson is Joseph, So You Want to Become Great. What is great? You know, when you see somebody go, well, they're a great sports person. Is that it? You know, what does that encompass? It's so you can hit a ball of some sort in a goal or a hole. But what is that their whole life? That's actually just what they do for a living. What about their marriage? What about their parenting? What about their impact on people? So even that expression, so you want to become great, it's loaded really. It's awkward. It's, what does that actually mean? When I'm talking about so you want to become great today, the real issue is, do you want to become great in the eyes of God? Because you're here at church, and it's all about God. So being great in your parents' eyes or your eyes is very different to being great in the eyes of God. So today we're going to be taking a look at the character of Joseph in the Old Testament, found in Genesis chapter 30 to 50. It's one of the great stories of the Bible. And uh, his parents were Ra- uh, Jacob and Rachel. He had 11 brothers and one sister. Maybe, you, maybe some of you have quite a few brothers and You sort of go, you know, that was a little bit difficult. He lived in the land of Canaan and Egypt in his lifetime. He had a colorful life. He started life as a shepherd. He became a slave. Later, he went to prison as a convict. And then he was raised up to become a ruler, second only to the mighty Pharaoh of Egypt. So what would that be today? I don't know, the vice president of America, something like that. By the end of his life, he had become a powerful leader who was spiritual. Imagine we actually were led in our countries by spiritual people. How that would change our country. He became wise, kind, generous, effective, and totally God-focused. Yet in order to get to this point in his life, God had to first give him a great vision for his life that he would do great things. So he was somebody that wanted to do something great. Then he had to mold his character by humbling him. That's the bit we don't like. (laughs) Teaching him leadership skills by being unfairly treated. So often the best way to learn how to lead somebody is go, somebody hurt me and I promise I will never do that to somebody else. He taught him compassion. Kindness and patience by being falsely accused and punished for things that he did not do. He taught him to be spiritual by taking all freedom away from his life so that he had to seek and trust in God solely. You know, so many people want to do something great, but they don't want to get on the path to greatness. They just want it to happen overnight. You know, are you ready to be molded by God today? What most people long for is a comfortable life. Yet comfortable societies create weak, overfed, entitled individuals. It has been said hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. And weak men create hard times. You want to be great, you better brace yourself for a hard life. Point one, to be great, you must change your character. To be great, you must change your character. We start in Genesis 37, verse 2. It says, Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending his flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilphah, his his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made him an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said, listen, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the fields when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream. 
And he told this to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, this is the dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in his mind. Let's state the obvious here. Joseph was bad at relationships. He was critical of his brothers instead of helpful. He gave a bad report to his brothers, of his brothers to his father, rather than approach them and dealing with it himself. He didn't go to them and go, hey, I think you could do this better. He just went on telltale. This showed a cowardice in Joseph. It showed his unloving nature. We can do this when we slander people. Do you hear what that so-and-so did? Rather than actually going to them, it's easier to be a coward and tell somebody than the actual person. Later in life, Joseph will find out just what it was like to be accused of doing bad things by someone and the devastating effect it can have on someone's life when Potiphar's wife gave a bad report about him, which actually sent him to jail. Joseph should have tried to help his brothers and therefore won them over. This is what Jesus tells us to do in Matthew 18, 15. If your brother or, sin, brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen, you have won them over. So he just said, you know, when you see something in someone, the goal is to help them and win them over and build your relationship, not break your relationship. You know, I wonder if his blinding self-righteousness, Joseph thought he was actually good at relationships. And that's why his father loved him so much. You know, I've got to be good at relationships because my dad loves me more than anybody else. You know, we can hold on to false truths to convince ourselves we're actually good at relationships when we're not. Joseph acted in a way that made his others jealous of him. His father loved, his brother, loved him more than his brothers, and he gave him this sort of flashy coat. There's actually a musical, Joseph and his Technicolor Dream Coat, that was quite famous a few years ago. You know, you can imagine him walking in going, hey, look at me. You know, I, I appreciate the ushers today, dressing up nice, everything like that. It's cool, but I mean, I didn't see Gabe... Gabe coming in today and going, hey, look at me, okay? Maybe you should have, looked pretty fine. Okay, but the Bible says, let another man sing your praises. He loved being the center of attention. You know, he shouldn't have worn it. That's the truth. He should have actually talked to his dad and said, dad, what you're doing is wrong, singling me out. You either have to give a cloak to everybody or to nobody. Later in life, Joseph would learn what it was like to be unnoticed, even forgotten about, as he was sent to jail and forgotten about for years by the cupbearer who helped him. See, God has a way of using our sin, discipling it, and getting us to see it later on in life. Joseph was self-righteous. When God gave Joseph a dream of his amazing future, he eagerly told his brothers how great he would be compared to them. Even after they challenged him on his arrogance, he still went and told them a second dream. Like he didn't figure it out. He's like, you know, I know you're upset, but what do I care? I mean, I'm the center of the dream. <laughs> his insensitivity and lack of love to, towards others and his family knew no, no bounds. You know, selfishness is rampant today. People are addicted to their phones. I mean, it's sad. You go to a restaurant, and I don't know why people do this. They go to a restaurant, and they just sit there on their phone. That's an expensive, self-indulgent time. Why not just cook at home or get a takeaway? Do you know what I mean? But you've got this fancy restaurant, and people just do this the whole time. And yet, that is where the world is at. Um, Joseph would soon learn the consequences of hurting and treating people badly, as these people that he was hurting were just about to hurt him. You know, they say hurt people hurt people. That's why we need to love people so that they can learn to love people. All those relationships, including the ones he wanted like his father and mother, were just about to be taken away from him. You know, his sins nearly got him killed, which was the hand of God making Joseph face up to the consequences of his sin 
to change Joseph. God wants us to look in the mirror and actually see us how he sees us. You know, in Genesis 37, 17, it says, So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we will see what comes of his dreams. He ticked everybody off so much around him that they went, we're so mad enough, we're going to kill our brother. So yes, Joseph was bad at relationships. What character sin are you not dealing with in your life that God is trying to help you deal with? That is the real question. Go on, I'm great at relationships. Well, maybe there's something else. Is it pride, contempt, an insubmissive attitude? You know, these sins hurt and wound everybody around them. And yet people like this often feel like it's so unfair when they're challenged. You know, proud people, they're, they're super sensitive because they're proud. And, and they go, you, I feel really hurt when you challenge me because I, I just feel like it's unfair. But they have no problem hurting everybody else around them with their pride. People don't go unpunished as God detests pride. Proverbs 16, 5, the Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. This whole concept of God loves everybody, he doesn't. God has the ability to love everybody, and God wants to love everybody. But sin separates us from God. And so when we're in a state of sin, it's hurtful to God, and we are separated from him. That's not what he desires, but if you perpetuate in your sin... That is what you actually desire. You go, no, I don't. What you say and what you do are very different. God judges us by what we do, not what we say. Is it laziness and lukewarmness? Laziness and apathy have no place in the Christian life, let alone in leaders in God's kingdom. I just don't care. I just, you know, well, I've got all the time in the world. Yeah, for you, what about helping other people? Laziness brings spiritual poverty and death to a ministry and lukewarmness is revolting to God. Proverbs 10, 4, lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. You know, rich people understand this. They work hard to get wealth. And yet when we become spiritual, we, we go, yeah, I don't need to really work hard at being spiritual. Surely, if there is a heaven and hell, the thing you need to work at most in life is to be spiritual. You know, you can spend 40, 60 hours at work, but when all is said and done, that means nothing. How much money you have in your bank means nothing if your spiritual life is nowhere. Is it self-righteousness and criticalness? These are all rooted in self-adoration. The sins of Satan and lead to your own destruction. Luke 18, 14, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. These sins push people away from you. The very opposite of Jesus who attracted people to him to make them spiritual. When somebody goes, I feel lonely. People who feel lonely are bad at relationships. Does that, does that make sense? I feel like that's because you're bad at relationships. Well, no, I'm not. I've got lots of friends. Well, hold on a sec. Either you have a lot of friends and you're not lonely, all right, or you're lonely and you don't have real friends. But you can't say, I have loads of friends and be lonely. That's a contradiction in terms. And yet many people go, I have lots of friends, but I still feel lonely. What about a lack of love and rudeness? I think about how religious people can be some of the rudest people in the entire world. 2 Timothy 3, 1 says, mark this, there will be terrible times in the last day. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, Without love, unforgiving, slanderous, not lovers of good, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. People go, well, they may pray all day, and they may go to church all day, and even read their Bible all day, but man, when I get them, I, feel, I just feel so condemned by them. Everybody is a sinner. The issue is, do we get alongside each other and help each other become godly? 
There is no one man that is better than another in the eyes of God because we fall so far short. We are all trying to help each other be close to God. That's the bottom line. And yet, growing up, I know growing up in a church, some of the churches I went to, they were just plain unfriendly. They were just rude. You know, church finished at 10 and you just ran out the door. Why? Because everybody was unfriendly. That's why Christianity is in such a mess. It's about duty. It's about ticking boxes. I get with many people I saw the Bible go, just, I just don't like Christians. I go, I'm with you, mate. They're so self-righteous that I said, I'm with you. I'm with you. I just like Jesus. And I'm just trying to be like him. But the religious world is a mess. It's a mess. You know, when we lack love, we lose all power. You may think you're loving because you compare yourself to others, but the problem is that we need to be comparing ourselves to Jesus. Ask yourself a simple question. If you're here as a Christian, did you help somebody become a Christian in the last 12 months? It's a fairly good indication of whether you're actually loving someone, whether you're good at loving people. Because there are lots of people out there who want to follow Jesus. 1 Corinthians 3, 13, 2 says, If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge and have faith that can move mountains, but if I don't have love, I'm nothing. You know, when I was a young Christian, I thought, if I could learn the Bible so well and learn all the other religions and I could sit down with someone, I could clearly teach them intellectually that God is true, the Bible is true, and other religions are lost, surely I would be able to build a church and masses of people would come because of my knowledge. Absolute hogwash. Rubbish. People come because of love. Now you need to sit down and deal with doctrine. You do. But actually, you only have a certain amount of hours in a week, so you can only love a certain amount of people. So you have to be supremely loving, kind, teach a small group of people to be supremely loving and kind, and then they teach a small group of people to be loving and kind, and it goes on. It's not about knowledge. The Bible says knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. It's about love. And Joseph was bad at relationships. Point two, to be great, you must embrace the journey of purification. You must embrace the journey of purification. You know, God brings a sober estimation of yourself to your doorstep. Genesis 37, verse 23, we'll carry on. It says, so when J Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing. And they took him and threw him into a cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming down to Gilad. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brothers and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he's our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. So Joseph, Mr. Fancy Pants, was stripped of his possessions, stripped bare. He was stripped of his basic needs, water and food. And he was sold for 20 shekels of silver which I figured out is 230 grams of silver, which today is 175 Australian dollars. That's what he was sold for. See, Joseph had a very inflated view of himself. It made him entitled, proud, and self-righteous. The truth was that outside of his own mind, he was worth no more than a day's wages today. That was Joseph's worth in the world without God, $175. That's all they got for him. They must probably looked at him and went, you know what? He's got soft boy hands, can't do much labor, you know, really is bad at relationship. I mean, what's he worth? Yeah, I'll give you a couple of hundred bucks for him. All of a sudden, Joseph felt his true worth without God. 
You know, we are not to have such arrogant and entitled views of ourselves like Joseph. But we are called to have the view of Christ. Now, Jesus was perfect, all right? Did miracles. Pretty cool guy, okay? Had the right answer for everything. And yet it's said in Philippians 2, 3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not look into your own interests, but to each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So Jesus didn't walk around and say, hey, I'm God. I'm Jesus. You, you don't believe me? Let me see you do a miracle. I'm just, you know, pimp my Jesus. Do you know what I mean? Like, I am the man. That's not what he did. And yet men walk around trying to find self-worth from the world as opposed to self-worth from God and your relationship with God. See, the solution to change Joseph's heart and attitude and thinking was to make him a slave. A slave lose all rights to ownership of their possessions, time, dreams, decisions, schedule, food, and they are completely subject to the will and whims of their master. He went from fancy pants to slave. That's what it took to get his attention. This was the next stage in Joseph's life or training to make him useful to God. He had to learn to be a happy slave. Mark 10, 44, it says, And whoever wants to be first must be a slave for all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So in this period of his life, everything was stripped bare of him so that he could learn to be happy as a slave. God is brutal. God is determined to mold you, to use you. He'll strip everything from you to make you a slave for him. See, he created you so that he could use you. You think about this in anything. We have a beautiful dog. She's called Mischief. But if Mischief starts to act up and hurt other people and, and not give pleasure to us and and, you know, look after the house and everything like that. In the end, we'll get rid of the dog. Yeah, well, I'm a human being. How dare God do that? Your arrogance comes out because you honestly think that you're important. And that's the problem. How can you be used by God when you still think you're important? Your value is your value inside God. You know, have you understood that? Are you now ready to move on to your next stage of training, becoming a hardworking servant? You know, that's the next stage. We've got to learn that everything we have can be taken away from us. And then we need to be a wholehearted servant for God. If we go on to Genesis 39, verse 1. Look at the next stage. Genesis 39, 1. It says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all of that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. So notice, while the Lord was disciplining him, he never left Joseph. Joseph mastered the attitude of being a great slave and started to become successful as a slave. Our success in our master's house depends upon us embracing the position that he has given us at that time, whether it be a slave for our master, and that being Jesus Christ. It's our reverent submission to God's will for our life 
that moves God's hand to be with us. Hebrews 5, 7 says, During the last days on Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who can save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. We are heard by God. People go, God isn't answering me. Maybe that's because you're going, God, give me this, 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 this. Our prayer should be, God, show me what you want me to do. Point me in the right direction. Help me be happy with what you've given me. Help me see your will for my life clearly. They're the prayers where we go, God, just use me. Just use me. You know, Joseph was promoted from slave to servant. A servant has certain privileges from his master because his master favors him. And he had a relation with his master to some degree. This was like he became a favorite servant. And he moves from having to do something as a slave to wanting to do something for his master due to now him being well treated. He goes, uh, you know, I've landed on good feet. I I'm in a good master's house. It could be worse. You know, a servant in God's house is better than any position in the world. Psalm 84 or 10 says, Better is one day in the courts, in your courts, than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the house of the wicked. We are to serve our God by serving others. That's how we show it. I do want to commend the ushers. You know, Jeremy and Maggie have taken over and everybody's come in their suits and everything. That's one aspect of serving. Serving in children's ministry. Cooking for other people. Helping people with their studies when, you know, we may be in, in year three uh, in a degree and we get with a year one and we go, well, I'll choose you for free because we just serve each other. Visiting the sick. If people miss church, going and taking communion with them. It's all about serving people. You know, once we have learned to be a true servant of Christ, we're now ready to move on to the next stage of God's training to greatness. You go, great, I don't want to be a slave. I don't want to be a servant. What's the next stage? Let me get there quick. The next stage is learning to be treated unfairly for doing what is right. You know, in Australia, we're all about justice. We're all about, you know, give them a fair go and get a fair go. It's a myth. It's a myth. We've got to learn to be treated unfairly for doing right and get happy with it. Genesis 39, verse 6, the story goes on. It says, now Joseph was a well-built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told him, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns has been entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house to attend his duties and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. This Hebrew slave you brought us came to me and made sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story of his wife, told him, saying, this is how your slave treats me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. You know, Joseph seemed to do everything right. Seemed like he'd learned his lesson. You know, just because you do everything right, it doesn't mean that everything will go right for you. Sin, sinful people, your own naivety, Satan, and a whole lot of other factors determine the outcome of your life. Joseph seemed to be caught in a no-win situation. Sleep with a woman, gain her favor, knowing that at the end it would lead to disaster, or flee from this woman and upset her, and end up in disaster, which he did in prison. The problem with so many people today is that they expect justice. Justice happens on judgment day. We expect life to be fair, good, and right. For God to make everything go right for them because 
They want to do what's right and love God. They forget that if life didn't go well for an even perfect Jesus, it will never happen to us. So Jesus never sinned, and yet he was brutally murdered at the end of his life. Somewhere along the line, people are brought into the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. Follow God and everything will go right. No, no, no. Follow God and he will teach you how to handle life. That's the difference between us and non-Christians. Non-Christians turn to alcohol, they turn to drugs, they turn to anger. Christians turn to God. But life will never go right. We just know how to handle it. It's life's twists and turns that train us, if we let them, to make us godly like Jesus. You know, 1 Peter 2, 18 to 24, it talks about, you know, Jesus was able to handle the unjust treatment. That's why we are Christians. We follow his example. In these opportunities, we have the chance to show the world and God just how spiritual we can be. Many of you know the story. Some of you are new, but uh, my wife and I, um, to go into the ministry and train for the ministry, we had some wealth. We were in Brisbane, and we used that wealth to train the ministry and help set up the church. And we just trusted God with our future. Um, Kerry's parents, when they passed away, left us a bit of money. We were able to get back on the property market. And uh, so we went, you know, we've got money. We don't have money. Then we have money. You know, we're in our 50s, 60s. Bought a house. Six weeks into buying this house, which was in Mascot Towers, uh, the 140 apartments started to go this way, literally. And everybody was uh, evacuated. And so now we have an apartment that we've only lived in for six weeks that we can't live in that's falling down. And we're half a million dollars in debt to a mortgage to a house that we don't own. And for the last five years, this has been going back and forth. And so not only are we in debt, it looks like we're going bankrupt. Uh, we're getting older. And they said that was the last mortgage we could get. And we're like, so we need to go bankrupt. And life goes up and down. Well, this week, we got final confirmation that actually the government has paid our half a million mortgage straight off. Yeah. It's done. Everything's signed off, which is flat awesome. That was, so there's your half a million done, just gone. It was really funny. My friend said, yeah, I knew it would happen. I'm like, great for you to feel like that. Let me tell you, for me, I didn't feel like that. Do you know what I mean? Like inside. And, and you're like, that's life. It's so uncertain. There's no justice. And yet, throughout all that situation, we put in an emergency accommodation where we had three bedrooms as opposed to a two-bedroom apartment. As a result, my daughter moved back in, and that really helped us reconcile our relationship and become very close. And so in all of that, I've got an incredible relationship with my daughter because of a financial disaster. Let me just tell you, a reconciled relationship with my daughter is worth far more than half a million dollars. Not only that, when we were moving everything out of the house, I was with a Christian having this Christian conversation. This guy, Cedric, overheard us and came to church and became a Christian. So if one person's soul is worth half a million dollars, then that's what it's worth. But you see, life goes up and down. The only difference was, is as we were moving out of the house, there were a lot of lonely people in, in the 140 apartments. And we were, we were just happy, you know, even when there was the press, and it was a big press thing, I'd come out of the press, and they'd, and how do you feel, Mr. Willis, about everything? i go, I feel pretty fired up, actually. <laughs> I haven't got cancer. I've got a beautiful wife. I was not on the news. <laughs> the people that were on the news were, it's terrible, <laughs> like this. And we were, I was known as the happy minister that lived in the apartment. And so all these lonely people said, we've got none, no family to move out. Can your Christians help us? So all the Christians were going in, moving all these people out because there was the happy minister, the only one that's not sad. Because I've got a relationship with God and a beautiful wife and great friends. Sadly, during those five years, some people have died out of depression. Some people have got divorced. See, it's a relationship with God that helps you handle the challenges. I mean, yeah, well, what are you going to do now? I haven't got a clue. I didn't know five years ago. I didn't know ten years ago. I'm just hanging on to Jesus, man. <laughs> to Joseph credit, he did not become bitter, but just got on with being godly and working hard. Genesis 32, 20. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those who held in prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. God was still with Joseph. 
Why? Because God was training him. Then the final stage of training was to be at peace and happy with being forgotten. See, the warden put him in charge of the prisoners. And soon afterwards, Pharaoh's cupbearer and chief baker, who had offended Pharaoh, were thrown into prison. Both men had dreams, and Joseph interpreted their dreams. And Joseph said to the cupbearer in Genesis 40, 23, uh, he, he talked about, hey, when you get out of this, remember me. And it says, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Have you ever done really, like you really love people, you really serve you, and they just forget you? Maybe you've been in this church, and I've never mentioned you in a sermon in the 10 years that you've been in the church. It's not like I keep a checklist. I'm sorry. I love you. You're awesome. But, you know, sometimes it can be like that. You, you really give your heart, and you just feel like nobody even notices. Have you ever just not got the recognition you deserve? It exposes a lot in our hearts when we don't get praise. I just don't feel encouraged. That's because you're looking for your encouragement from man, not from God. See, what comes out of your heart at that moment is what's already in your heart. You go, I'm bitter because this person did this to me. No, you're bitter because you're bitter. See, if you get an orange and you squeeze an orange, what comes out? Apple juice? No. The only thing that can come out of an orange is orange juice. So when pressure is put on you, if you're an angry person, guess what? Anger comes out, all right? If you're a sullen person, you just hide in a corner, all right? If you're a bitter person, things come out. In other words, the pressure God puts on you just exposes who you are. Don't blame anybody else. Just look at who you are. Mark 7.20 says, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For from within, out of a person's heart, comes evil thoughts, sexual morality. In other words, your sin is your sin. Nobody made you do it. The pressure just exposed it. When praise for our deeds is little or non-existent, it exposes who we are really doing this all for, us or God. Being unforgotten or unrecognized can be one of the most purifying times of your life and ultimately may be the difference long-term between staying saved or not. I think about our disciples in China. We can't show you their faces. We can't share the good news. We can't put them on emails and send their picture everywhere. They are there building the church, being arrested and going to prison, and you'll never, ever know. You'll meet them in heaven, and you'll go, I don't recognize you. You are none of the good news emails. I said, I know. I was in China. You go, okay, amen. Great. They'll never get the recognition. There's no sermons being recorded with going, hey, this brother. Da -da 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 -da. I can tell you Hank got engaged last night. That I can tell you. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> He's just somebody in China that some people know of and some people don't. Okay. But you'll never know. And yet we're like, man, it's been four weeks since my name was mentioned. I brought three people to a Bible talk on Friday and no one even took note. Who are you doing it for? Are you looking for the approval of man or God in your godliness? If you're struggling to be motivated, maybe the issue is who you're doing it for. Motivation as a Christian purely comes from doing things for God. So 2 Corinthians 7, 11 says, See what this godly sorrow has produced in you, what earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourself, what indignation. Sometimes I hear young people go, You're just doing it for Joe the minister. Like that's my fault. That's not my fault. I give direction in the church and we need that. Where do we go on Sunday? Whatever like that. That's your fault. You've got to go and deal with your heart. I appreciate what Beth was saying. It's really easy to slip into duty rather than devotion. Really easy. That's, you need to do a heart check on that. Unhappiness is a gift from God. It is. If you're unhappy, it's like there's something wrong. I need to go out to God and have a great prayer time with him and sort this one out. You know, you can't move on to the next stage of this being molded by God until you've mastered the one that you're in. You know, if you're not happy being a slave, you'll always be a slave. You won't move up to being a servant. If you're not happy to be a servant, then a servant you will stay. If you're not happy with injustice, then injustice will come. Because you've got to learn to do everything for God. Sometimes you have to be sent back a stage 
or to the beginning to relearn the lesson. That's a sad thing. What stage are you at in life? What are you doing to master your stage to get to the next one? You know, to be great, point three, you must surrender yourself to God's ultimate purpose for your life. What was the purpose of Joseph's life? I mean, so far, it's been pretty bad, right? <laughs> he's arrogant, he gets smashed, he's a slave, he's a servant. Like, where's all the glory coming? What's it all about? You know, his life was certainly not about living a life of comfort. Doing what Joseph wanted to do, going where he wanted, having pleasure and popularity. It was not to be a shepherd. He wasn't called to be a shepherd. He wasn't called to be a slave. He wasn't called to be a servant, and he wasn't called to be a forgotten convict. These were just stages of training and discipline from God to get him to the greater purpose of his life. Joseph eventually saw clearly that everything that he did and went through as, was to save other people. There's a remarkable passage in Genesis 50 verse 19 where his brothers come to him and they're feeling really guilty that they sold him into slavery. And they've suddenly learned that, man, their slavery, selling him into slavery gave him this terrible life. But now they are before him and Joseph is now the ruler second only to the Pharaoh of Egypt. And he turns around to them in Genesis 59. He says, but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I not, am I in the place of God? You intended harm for me, but God intended it for the good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. It was all about him being molded so he could save lives. When we become Christians, it's all about molding your character so you can save more people. See, when you're a Christian, you can't become more saved. When you're a Christian, you're saved. That's it. I'm not more married today to my wife than I was 20, 30 odd years ago. Couldn't think quickly enough, honey. 27. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, I don't miss my anniversary. Let me say that. Okay. Um, but I'm like, I'm not more married. Prayerfully, I'm a better husband. As a Christian, once you're saved, the only thing that you should be consumed with is being better at saving other people. That's it. God did not rescue Joseph from his trials. In fact, he either allowed them to happen or made them happen because God is suffering. They had made Joseph into the man Pharaoh can use. You think about this. So Joseph comes out of the prison. He's before Pharaoh. This guy doesn't know him at all. He interprets his dream and Pharaoh says in Genesis 41, 38, so Pharaoh asked him, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. He went from a prison to the second most powerful man in the world overnight. Why? Because through all of this, there wasn't a hint of bitterness in him. See, when you're bitter, you can't see God. All you see is man. That's all you see. Joseph was like, you know what? It was all about God. And I'm at peace with that. God wants you to be molded to do something great for him. On judgment day, the only thing that you can take with you into heaven is other people. That's it. That's it. You will take no possessions. You'll take no memories. The only memories you will have are the people. For me, I'll be honest, this church is my memories and those churches that we plant. You're what I take to heaven with you. My wife, my family prayerfully, and you, that, that's it. And as you grow old in the faith, that's it. Every year we just, when we have our Christmas party, it's like, who's saved? That's all we count. At the conference, you know, when we see, we go, you know, we, see, we say, see, maybe Hank will come to a New Zealand. We go, Hank, buddy, you're still faithful. Amen. It's great. Show us the ring. Amen. <laughs> but that's what it's all about. You know, many are invited to be great, but few are chosen. Bitterness at the stage of being a slave will take you out. Bitterness of being a servant will take you out. Bitterness and not having praise from men will take you out. But not Joseph. Joseph weathered it all. You know, when I uh, first 
uh, found out that our house was falling down and um, uh, it was stressful. There's no doubt about it. That it was a lot of stress and I was praying lots of nights and stuff like that. And um, Jesse's father was uh, coming along and he said, I'm watching you. I'm going to see how you react to this to see whether you're a man of grace. I texted him this morning. Because I know he was praying as well as many of you were, and I thank you for your prayers. And I said, thanks for your prayers. But that rebuke from him helped me handle it. Because I thought people are watching. How you handle your trials, your family are watching. Your friends are watching. The people you reach out to are watching. They're going, you say you're a Christian. Let me see it. You want to become great? To be great, you've got to change your character. That's one of the most difficult things you can ever do. To be great, you've got to embrace the journey of purification. You go, man, I'm, I'm 22. I don't want to do that. Nor do I. You know, it never stops, the journey of purification. To be great, you've got to surrender to God's ultimate purpose for your life. Let's just look at the year. It's a year of blessings. That's what we've called it. Has it been a blessed year for you? If you're not here as a Christian, surrender to becoming a Christian. Get your life sorted out. Get on the journey. If you're not fruitful, get on the journey to being fruitful. If you're not in leadership, get on the journey to leadership. If you've not changed what you know you need to change, get on the journey to change. It's time to step up and actually be on a biblical adventure rather than just reading about biblical adventures. My challenge to you, if you're here today, study the Bible afterwards today and watch how God will change your life. Amen.